Classes in Polymer Dynamics, based on George Philly's book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And today, this lecture is Lecture 20, Dynamic Structure Factor and the Slow Mode. I'm Professor Phillies, and today we're going to advance to continue our discussion of light scattering spectroscopy and the dynamic structure factor of polymer solutions. In our last lecture, which for the live audience was a while ago, I discussed something of how light scattering spectroscopy works. The core issue is you send in a laser beam, it's coherent monochromatic light, it scatters out in an angle, the scattering process can be described by the first order Born approximation because, at least in usable systems, scattering is quite weak. As a result, the incident beam is the same in intensity everywhere along its length. The, um, it's a plane wave up to some optics questions which are actually quite tricky. Uh, the collecting optics just pick up plane waves and with reasonable design you can get by with some pinholes and minimize loss of scattered light. Uh, the thing that does the scattering is a for spatial Fourier component of the index of refraction, or put it alternatively, the density of scattering particles. And so we are looking at a spatial cosine wave in concentration, and the spatial cosine wave decays in time due to diffusion. Now there are a few minor questions that you'll have here. The first, if, if you're completely unfamiliar with this, the first is, gee, where did that spatial cosine wave come from? Did you use some complicated layering technique and insert it into the system? And the answer is no the particles move around at random. If they were arrayed in a crystal, with a few exceptions, the spatial Fourier components of the density would all be zero, well, except for the lattice planes, and you'd see no scattering from them. Um, however, the particles do move at random. If we do a description of the concentration versus position, it has spatial Fourier components which fluctuate in time, and then, um, gee, at some points they're large and at other points they're small. What we do through a numerical technique known as the intensity correlation function is to ask and answer the following questions. Suppose at some given moment, as a result of the random motion, the spatial Fourier component of the concentration is quite large. Well, that can certainly happen randomly, but it's going to be very small part of the time. It should be very large at least part of the time. Having found those moments when the fluctuations are quite large, we then ask what happens on the average as time goes on. And the answer, this is the Anzager regression hypothesis, is that on the average, as time goes on, the concentration of particles goes down. It goes down to, well, we're looking at a spatial Fourier component, it goes down to zero on the average, and the intensity of the scattered light on the average relaxes back towards zero. In fact, since we're looking at a concentration cosine wave, you stick the cosine wave into Fick's law of diffusion, and out comes a dying exponential. <coughs> now, this technique is a 1960s technique as originally created. The reason it shows up at first in the 60s and then bloomed in the 80s and 90s is a, a, a series of technical advances which made the method possible. The first technical advance was the laser. Now, the issue with the laser, there are actually two issues with the laser. The first issue with the laser is that it's a source of coherent monochromatic 
light. And as a res the issue is here, here is our scattering volume. The light comes in from the side. It's scattered from particles in different sides of the region. It heads out towards the observer, and you would like interference between light scattered from here and light scattered from here. Well, in order to do that, the light here and the light here have to be consistent in their phase as time goes on. However, we have a laser beam going this way. It has a consistency in phase over some distance, um, and that distance has to, which is called the coherence length, has to be large relative to the volume we're looking at. Well, that sounds impressive. Real lasers, even 1960s commercial lasers, had coherence lengths that could be easily kilometers. However, think about this. You realize the sample volume we're talking about is not a kilometer long. It's uh, the focused width of the laser beam, which might be 100 microns. And it might be the length of the scattering volume, given that we have collecting pinholes a millimeter. As long as the coherence length is long by comparison with a millimeter, you have the coherence you need. If you've ever done Michelson interferometry with a mercury arc source as opposed to a laser, you realize that a millimeter is actually quite short. And a classical light source, if you filtered it down, has plenty of coherence length for the experiment. This has been confirmed experimentally. People have done quasi-elastic light scattering spectroscopy using highly filtered sunlight. However, they hit a problem. And the problem they hit is the the other advantage of the laser, the important advantage of the laser. The important advantage of the laser is that it is bright. <coughs> In the laser beam, which is very narrow, you are putting through a great deal of power. Now you may say, gee, a laser is 20 milliwatts or a watt. A one watt light bulb is almost nothing. However, if I have a one watt light bulb, it gives off light in all directions. The laser beam comes out of the laser in a straight line. You can treat it as a point source, but the, the notional point source is many kilometers to the rear of the laser. A one watt light bulb kilometers away you don't see. The laser is plenty bright enough to damage a human eye if you are not respectful of laser light. The major advantage of the laser then was brightness. This is why focusing lenses are so important. Well, why is brightness important? Can't you just integrate for longer? As we'll make clear in a few moments, light scattering is actually a two-photon process. You're comparing the intensity now and the intensity at a later moment and in order to do that, you need to have had at least one photon here and at least one photon here. As a result, the signal, not just the signal, the signal to noise ratio goes up with the brightness of the laser. That's very important. The second reason we are looking at a 1960s, 1970s technique is digital electronics. Now, the digital electronics shows up in two different ways. Uh, the less obvious way is that it shows up is that you are running the experiment, and because you have a computer in the lab, which was extremely exotic when I started as a graduate student in 1969, because you have a computer in the lab, we had our first around 70 or so, you can measure the spectrum, do the data analysis in a couple of minutes, and see immediately, gee, this, everything is doing well, uh, something has to be adjusted, there's funny background noise, the sample is no good. And because you can do the data analysis immediately, you can correct on the fly. When I started out, you measured the spectrum, which took hours, <coughs> 
You digitized the spectrum, this took a while. You typed the spectrum into computer cards, and you took the computer cards to the computer center. And the next day, you had a discovery of what you'd measured. This was incredibly slow and inefficient and ineffective. There are no two ways about it. It just did not work as a highly effective way for doing large scale, as opposed to look at the neat experiments we can do, demonstrations. Computers in the lab fixed all that. Uh, the second issue, which is just as important, is that, well, suppose you, I gave you a laser and you were in 1950 or 45. You could, could still have done the experiment. You still had photon counting electronics. And you could have done the experiment by using a device known as a wave analyzer that measured the frequency spectrum. The frequency spectrum um, was measured by analog means, because that's what a wave analyzer was. Even if you worked very hard, if you proposed you could get a signal-to-noise ratio in the experiment of 100, uh, you were being wildly optimistic. A uh, 100 is abysmally bad doing dig with digital electronics in time domain. So let us consider how we actually measure a correlation function in time domain so we remember what it is we're measuring. We're measuring intensity at time t, intensity at time t plus tau, and then we're taking an average. Now the best you can do is always to do, if you're looking at light, is to do photon counting. I saw a photon, it showed up at this moment in time. And that is the best you can do if you say, oh, we've got lots of light, you, let's do analog signal analysis. You are throwing away vast amounts of information. However, in, in practice what you can do is to say, I have a detector. It gives me an electronic pulse that corresponds to the fact that we detected the um, photon. Uh, the analog, the, digit, the voltage pulse has some shape, and you push the shape through a bunch of signal processors, and the signal processors do a very nice job of uniformitizing things. And then you do what is called leading edge detection, that is, you don't look to say, where is the middle of the signal? You look at where the signal is first ramping up. And you can actually measure leading edges quite uh, accurately uh, in, in position, say, to within a nanosecond, or with slightly older systems, 10 nanoseconds or 50 nanoseconds. The pulse is wider than that. You then say, we will take the time axis and we will break it into bins. And the photons show up at different times. And we will count the number of photons in each time interval. Now, if a photon shows up right at the boundary, or very close, you need electronics that are designed so they always treat it the same way, and always put a count that showed up here into one bin or the other bin, but not both of them or neither of them. And that's one of these circuit design things that has long since been solved. This list of numbers can be called N1, N2, N3, N4, and it is a count of how many photons came in in each time interval. These numbers, counts of photons in time intervals of some width, are the intensity measurement. And you then form the correlation function, this thing. The correlation function as a function of time as number of photons in bin i, number of photons in bin i plus j, two, fo two bins separated in time by j bins. We'll get to what the j means in a moment. And we sum i equals 1 over to, out to some large number. How large a number? Well, 
A reasonable bin width might be a microsecond or less, typical number. You run the experiment for a reasonable number of minutes, so you might actually have 10 to the 9 samples that are more, go or 10 to the 10 samples going into your measurement. If you have 10 to the 10 samples going into your measurement, the statistical error in this can be made quite small. We'll get to that in a second. The other issue is that there's a time delay here. That was a continuous time. J is a number of bins. But the bins have a width delta. And we can write tau equal J delta. So if we compare intensity here and intensity one bin width later, you are measuring this correlation function at a time delay tau, which is in fact one delta. Now I have to put in some qualifications. The first qualification is that this process does not work for j equals zero. If you do the process for j equals zero, you do not measure the intensity correlation function at time zero. What is the complication? Well, suppose we do the <coughs> measurement for j equals one, because it's easy to draw the picture. The first photon came in someplace in time between here and there. The second photon came in someplace in time between here and here. And so we have an N1, which was, I guess, 1, and an N2, was, which was within 2. But the two photons could have come in right on top of each other, in which case we sampled C of tau for some very short time interval. It could also be that one photon came in here, and one photon came in there, and we sampled C of tau for two instants in time that are very nearly two delta apart. The result is that what we look at for a correlator, all of whose channels are the same width, is a wedge average in which we measure C of tau, except C of tau has been averaged with a weighting function that looks like this. So we put the most weight in the middle and less weight at the edges. Now you may then ask, well, how much error is there in, measure, in calling your measurement the correlation function at the middle time? And the answer is, the correlation function is a straight line, which it of course isn't. There is no error at all. It's exact. If the correlation function is very slightly curved, which is realistic, there is an error, but the error in saying the outcome of this measurement is the value of the correlation function at the midpoint, the error is proportional to delta tau squared. And as long as the correlation function doesn't change much during one bin width, which is the only way anyone in right mind would run the equipment, the error is small. Now, it be life becomes much more complicated if the two bins are of different width. It would be beyond this course to tell you why you are doing this other than to say, well, you know, if I plot a correlation function versus log time, and it has a couple relaxations in it, it looks like this. And out here, the change in the correlation function may take a second. In here, it took 20 microseconds. Yes, you notice there's a difference. Well, splitting this into one microsecond or tenth microsecond pieces makes sense because it's changing on a microsecond scale. But if you were out here and seeing something changing on a second scale, 
Splitting this into microsecond pieces is wasteful and in fact costs you signal. So you actually do this, and if you do this, the, um, with the time delay becomes much more complicated. And the answer is, approximately speaking, it's this time plus half of this time plus half of this time. The sa exactly the same formula works if all of the channels are the same width. Uh, this is approximate, this is, there is some, this is approximately this distance plus half of this distance. Because if that's huge and that's tiny, this width is almost negligible. Unfortunately, there has crept into the literature an extremely severe error known as the half-channel correction. And the half-channel correction, which is totally wrong, uh, as is shown by simple and direct analysis, which I have published in Review of Scientific Instruments, says that if we have two channels like this, these two channels are not separated by one bin, but what by one bin minus one half of this width, mm -hmm. or a half a bin. Well, that's completely wrong. The half-channel approximation is erroneous. The correct formula comes fairly close to it if this width is much larger than that width. So that is the sort of thing we do when we're doing light scattering spectroscopy. Okay, so we actually measure the correlation function. The function that is of interest, which I've discussed in past lectures, is not C of tau itself, but the time dependent part of C of tau, or actually its square root. And that's in a previous lecture, so we won't go over it again. Instead, we will push ahead and ask what happens when you do light scattering spectroscopy from polymer solutions. Well, the short form answer is you can do a whole series of different measurements on polymer solutions and do, ask different sorts of questions. And what, what are the possible answers? Well, one answer is we have a light scattering spectrum. Here's a, a non-logarithm linear plot. It looks like this. It's a decaying exponential. And one thing we can do is to measure the first cumulant or initial slope. Um, it turns out that that's actually fairly accurate as a method of characterizing spectra that are close to exponential. You actually do cumulant analysis, which we discussed earlier. And out of the first cumulant, you can infer a diffusion coefficient, which is unambiguous reproducible and describes the average relaxation going on in the system. Another experiment you can do is to make the scattering vector large. You make the scattering vector large by going to larger angle, by using violet light rather than red light. The opposite is you go to very low scattering angles and Q becomes smaller, meaning you're looking at distances over larger distances. You're, but you try to make QRG large. What's RG? It's the size of a polymer molecule. What does QRG large mean? Well, here's a polymer molecule, and we are sensitive to concentration fluctuations that look like this wave, meaning that light scattered from here on the polymer and light scattered from there on the polymer have different phases and interfere, and we can see the polymer molecule as it moves. Okay, what else can we do? Well, 
we can look at s of qt and ask how s of qt depends on wave vector and time and concentration. There's another experiment we can do. You remember I was discussing the photon correlation methods and it's really with classical means you could get down to something like 50 nanoseconds though you had to do some tricks with the photomultiplier tube detection to avoid photomultiplier tube noise and with modern technology you can get down to a few nanoseconds and a few nanoseconds though corresponds to oh a hundred megahertz there's an alternative scheme known as Fabry Perot there are alternatives to this interferometry uh, in which you measure the frequency spectrum of the light using, well it's fancier than using a prism and you measure what's going on in the gigahertz time scale. Now the gigahertz will not show you the large scale polymer motions. On, the, on gigahertz frequencies, meaning times much shorter than a nanosecond, polymer doesn't move. And so you aren't seeing whole polymer dynamics. But you can see solvent dynamics, and we'll talk about this later on. Okay, what else can you do? Well, some people would say you measure a diffusion coefficient, and from this you infer a dynamic scaling length. Um, the idea of the dynamic scaling length comes out of critical phenomena work where a formula like this works very well for describing how things move in say a binary liquid as you approach a consolute point. You approach the temperature and uh, concentration at which a binary mixture phase separates into two different liquids. Um, however, if you try to take the same formula and apply it to colloid diffusion, we've discussed this backwards a bit, say proteins, you discover that this formula is completely wrong. It's completely wrong in the simple sense that you can measure a diffusion coefficient, you can measure or calculate a distance over which particle motions are correlated. And if you say take a protein and increase their interactions by charging them up, changing the pH, re reducing salt concentration, you discover that as the, you increase the repulsive interactions, diffusion becomes faster and the correlation length becomes longer, not shorter as this formula would suggest. Okay, so those are the sorts of experiments one can look at. Way back at the front end, going back many years, there were people who said, well, let's start out and look at dilute polymers. After all, that's already a complicated problem. And this was done by, in particular, Picora in a series of papers. What he said was, here is a polymer chain, and we're at some wave vector, and we see scattering, and we even see scattering from, say, this part of the chain and that part of the chain, and because the path lengths from the laser to these points are different, light scattered from here on the polymer chain and from here on the polymer chain. Those two light waves have different phases and interfere. And so, as the polymer changes shape and these points move around, the amount of interference changes. Mm -hmm. So, in order to understand the spectrum, we have to understand the modes of motion of the polymer that we can see. And one motion was center of mass diffusion. That is, you can view that there is a center of mass. It does move, 
and it moves diffusively and that contributes to scattering a dm q squared. However, there's also a series of modes in which the polymer coil parts move with respect to each other. Mm -hmm. And what he was able to show was that one of those modes is dominant and it contributes a relaxation that goes as dmq squared plus 2 over tau. So there are, there are other modes. There, if I mean, you have n particles in that chain, there should be 3n modes, 3n minus 6 anyhow, internal modes. However, most of them don't scatter a lot of light. And if you analyze the first two modes, you can predict what the scattering spectrum does. <clears throat> Question. Why is it that the other modes don't scatter as much? Um, the other modes are rearrangements of particle positions in which, um, let's see, how do we describe this? The mode that will scatter, see here in the scattering planes in Born approximation, the mode that scatters will bunch the particles up on this plane. Imagine we decompose the internal density into a spatial Fourier components. Now there are also modes that would say bunch some stuff here and some stuff here and some stuff here and less there and there. And that would scatter light too. But uh, you don't get nearly as much of that. The polymer doesn't do nearly as much of that. Mm -hmm. And describing the polymer modes at a fairly low level of approximation is adequate. What is a fairly low level of approximation? Well, we could use the Kirkwood-Reisman description, which you'll be hearing about repeatedly. And what Kirkwood and Reisman said is, here is a polymer chain. It has a center of mass location, and the center of mass moves. We can describe, since it has a mass distribution, um, moments of inertia and axes, and the polymer coil does the motion of all of the beads has a component, which is orthogonal to everything else, which can be described as rotation around an axis. It doesn't have to be a symmetry axis, because after all, we're talking about diffusive motion. Also, this is a flexible object. And then we have what, um, so there was translation, there was rotation, and then we have what Kirkwood described as fluctuations, by which he meant things that are small, where the polymer was actually changing shape. Mm -hmm. And then there are an, ar an arbitrary number of different ways of describing the shape, of, of choosing modes. And as long as you have a, compl a complete orthogonal coordinates, it works. But the net result is when you do the calculation, there are only two modes that contribute. Thank you. Now I'm going to keep the modes and I'm going to point out something. That's namely the behavior of tau. This 1 over tau is a pro is some diffusion coefficient times q squared. That is, the faster the diffusion is, the slower the um, mo the shorter lived the mode is. Yes? Well, D describes the motion of a piece of polymer of approximate size 1 over Q. Yes? However, D is proportional diffusion coefficient is inverse in the size of the diffusing object. This is a very approximate argument, and meaning it's proportional to Q. And therefore, this 1 over tau, or dq squared, is actually proportional to qq. Now, if you step up your analysis of what the modes look like, you can do better than these hand waves on the blackboard. And you then get a q to the gamma for some power gamma, which is sort of like 3. Mm -hmm. 
What is the implicate? Oh, we can also calculate the intensities. You remember I said the other intensities were small? Well, you can also show that at small q, translation is dominant. At large q, this mode becomes dominant. In between, there's an average in which both terms contribute. If we step forward enough to the, toward the present, there is the nice work by Ellis. And what Ellis did was to use modern digital correlator technology, measure the whole spectrum to very high signal to noise over a very large range of times. And Ellis was actually able to measure the two mode relaxation rates separately, He's break the spectrum into modes. And, all, and look at the Q and the various dependences. And Ellis was actually able to see this directly. However, if we go back to 1970, this was not an option. With 1970 technology, you couldn't do the mode decomposition, you couldn't do the measurements accurately enough, you didn't see the, rela the um, relaxation spectrum over a wide enough range of um, times, and therefore what you actually measured was an average relaxation rate, or first cumulant, gamma 1. And gamma 1 was the light scattering intensity average, weighted average of these two relaxation times. So at small q, this was the bright mode, and the relaxation rate was like this. At large q, this was the bright mode, and because of this term, this effect, this was the dominant term, and the relaxation rate went like that. So what you did was to say, suppose I take the first cumulant, which was then sometimes called gamma, and in some papers was called capital omega, which it, it's not a frequency, and it's a little obscure that you're seeing it there, but that was the symbol that was used. And if you plot the first cumulant, however it's noted, noted over q cubed, what happens as a function of q? Well, at small cube, k1 is proportional to q squared, and if you divide by q cubed, you get 1 over q. At large q, this levels out and goes as q to the zero. Now you could just as well have plotted k1 itself, and k1 itself would have gone as q square at small q, and then rolled over to q cube at large q. There are just different ways to plot this. There are bunches of people who have done these experiments, and the general sort of consistent outcome is, yes, you do the measurements, and things work. We'll come to some issues with things work by and by. There is a historical issue because you can make predictions as to what this height should be. You can do a theoretical calculation and predict this height. And the theoretical models at the time we're sort of within 30% of getting the height right. Well, having said they're within 30% of getting the height right, you can either say, my cup is half full, or my cup is half empty. And if you read the papers at the time, there was a certain emphasis on half empty. No one was being negative about the quality of the experiments or the theory. It's just there was an emphasis that the, two, the theory and experiment had to if you look at the number of approximations you have to make in the theory to get to this, um, it is sort of like the tap dancing elephant. The, the issue is not, does an elephant tap dance well? The issue is, can the elephant tap dance, or if you prefer, go out on roller skates at all? I have actually seen a roller skating elephant. The answer is, they can. Of course, if you looked hard, you realize elephants are a bit heavy. The weight on the roller skate is such that the bearings completely seize up, 
and the elephant was simply walking in a pair of funny shaped shoes, but it was roller skating. I saw it myself. Um, in any event, having said, um, you see this, you can do those experiments and you sort of get the right results. And gee, you could probably improve it both by doing much better experiments and by doing more theory, but that's not what's happened yet. Okay, let's push on from this. The next thing I want to know is that one thing you can do is say we will look at non-dilute experiments. <clears throat> that is, we will actually take the concentration up. Now, <clears throat> there's some question. There were several people who worked on this at the same time. It appears to me, having looked at the literature, and yes, papers out of PhD theses show up late. It appears to me. The credit for the first actual experiment goes to a fellow in Switzerland by the name of Boult. Um, there were also a number of French groups that uh, did work at about, certainly about the same time, um, but he tends to be forgotten, so I'm bringing him up so he gets the credit he deserves. And what was to done, do, done was to measure, for example, the first cumulant as a function of concentration. Um, if, you are at, if you are at small q, if you are working at small q, um, the question of internal modes does not come up very much because they become invisible. You actually have to work decently hard to see the internal modes of people have done that. And what um, Bolt demonstrated was, you measure the diffusion coefficient as a function of concentration. There is an initial slope, um, which he discusses. And at small q, the slope is about the same at different wave vectors. Mm -hmm. um, there was a period early on when there was a feeling that if you measured diffusion coefficient, it dep should depend on wave vectors. And people tried, that is, distance over which particles move. But there was a very long time in which people would try experiments, and they would measure Q dependence, and they'd see absolutely nothing of any interest. Uh, in order to see the uh, polymer internal modes, you need quite very high molecular weight polymers. And you need, um, in addition to very high molecular weight polymers, you need um, ability to go quite low scattering angles reliably. This is all tricky. Um, so here's what both saw. Other people saw the same thing. Uh, I will mention very briefly some experiments by. Let me take this now. Another nice group of people. This is work by Koch. And they measured the diffusion coefficient versus concentration. But they also did static light scattering. That is, they measured the intensity of the scattered light. Now, why is it interesting to measure the intensity of the scattered light? Well, the reason it's interesting to measure the intensity of the scattered light is that the intensity of the scattered light is determined by how easy it is to create density fluctuations. If it's easy to produce density concentration fluctuations, they're big and you get a lot of light scattering. This is what leads to critical obalescence. If it's hard to produce concentration fluctuations, if the particles push away from each other and you can't cram them together easily, scattered light is weak. The intensity is determined by the osmotic compressibility, pi is the osmotic pressure, C is the concentration, inversely. The more the osmotic pressure changes as you change concentration, the harder the particles are repelling each other, and then, note the inverse, the weaker the light scattering. 
What Koch did was to say that the diffusion coefficient will be proportional to d pi dc, inversely proportional to f. Um, this is the generalized Stokes Einstein equation. As an issue the correct for correctly describing light scattering spectroscopy, the actual reference is my work in 1974. Until I published, there were a lot of people who thought that interparticle interactions did not change D at all. That was incorrect. Uh, there is, you could put into here a reference frame co uh, correction. Uh, there are also some constants that can be put in because there are some in interesting units issues which we'll skip over. The net result, though, is that Koch et al. measured the diffusion coefficient directly. They measured the scattering intensity and thus this thermodynamic derivative directly and therefore they were able to isolate F. And if you go into the book, if you go into figure, um, oh, I bet it's 11.1a, you can pl find plots of this drag coefficient F versus concentration, and you can find where I fit them with a slightly specialized function. And the fits are quite nice. Uh, another, however, let us stop with that and let us look at another paper. <clears throat> and this is work by Patterson, good guy, now at, if I recall correctly, Pittsburgh. And what Patterson did was to measure diffusion coefficient versus concentration. And what he found was there was an initial region which is quite linear, and then there is clearly a rollover and D goes down again. Uh, he is quite emphatic that there is no C to the X region. <coughs> Except in the sense that if I tell you I have a power law of almost any slope, someplace in here I can fit it as a tangent. Patterson demonstrates an extremely important data plotting issue where you would see get an artifact. The artifact is as follows. Suppose instead of plotting the diffusion coefficient as d against c, I plot log d against log c. Well, the logarithm function has an interesting feature. It takes this area that is very close to zero concentration and stretches it out to minus infinity. And so, if I plot something, this nice linear function versus log c, the little region in here becomes stretched out infinitely and looks flat. And if I don't look too far up in concentration, I can get something that looks on the log-log plot like a straight line. What P Patterson emphasizes is that this original C to the zero region, independent of concentration, is purely an artifact of how you chose to plot the data. There is no C to the zero region, and that's made immediately clear if you look at the simple linear plot. The reason it is important, Patterson's outcome is important, the reason it is significant to say there's just linear, there's no C to the zero region, is that there were several competing theories of polymer dynamics <coughs> which claimed that were polymers were non-interacting and therefore the diffusion coefficient was a constant, and they were non-interacting until the concentration was high enough that the polymer coils overlapped and became entangled. And so this was an actual theoretical prediction in which you sort of find people claiming they've seen the effect. 
They all did plots like this. What Patterson showed was that there is no C to the zero region. And the reason there is no C to the zero region is that polymers are interacting even at very low concentrations. Okay, and you can actually see this in figure 11.1b. So there, is, there are the results of Patterson. Okay. Uh, and we are now going to come up with G. Page. That's good. We are now going to come up with, well, let's see. Okay, so we have a linear region. Can we do anything with that? And the answer is yes. Note, for example, and there are a bunch of papers like this, and I'm just mentioning one, paper by Cotts and Seltzer. They measure D versus C. There is an initial slope, K sub D, which they could measure. And they did this for several different polymers. They did this for different under different they did this on different ways, so they did multiple measurements. But KD is something you can calculate. And therefore you can do a comparison of the calculation with the theory. And um, the theories are extensions of the Kirkwood Reisman theory. For example, there's one by Yamakawa. The extension of Kirkwood Reisman, and here's Kirkwood Reisman. There's one polymer chain. It translates, it has some axis about which it rotates, and beads on the polymer chain have hydrodynamic interactions. That is, if one bead is moving, the fluid around it must also be moving, and the fluid flow has a pattern which drags other beads along. That's hydrodynamic interactions. What Yamakawa did was to say, well, now we have two polymer coils, and a bead on this polymer coil can create a hydrodynamic flow, a wake, that acts on the beads of the other coil. And therefore, from this calculation, you can calculate what K sub D is. And you get reasonable agreement. Let us now bring the last two previous threads together. In one thread, we talked about D versus Q in dilute solution. And that was a theory by um, Pecora originally. There were experiments by Akchasu and Han and a series of other people uh, uh, which seemed to work. And that was dilute solution, D, pretty dilute solution, D versus Q. <clears throat> there were also people who looked at small Q at the wave vector dependence excuse me, at small q at the concentration dependence. So you have two different um, sorts of things you could look at. Well, you could do both of them at the same time. You could do a measurement of diffusion coefficient versus q, and you do this for a series of concentrations. And what the people chose to plot was the relaxation rate first cumulant versus Q square. What you expect to see, and in fact it is what you do see, is that for QRG less than 1 in dilute polymers, nothing much happens. But out here someplace, you get into the region where the internal mode is dominated, that is a Q cube dependence, and therefore gamma proportional to Q square, Q cube over Q square is proportional to Q to the first. And out here is a Q to the first region. Now this experiment is repeated for a series of samples of different concentration. And what you first find, there's a graph in the book, is that gamma comes along, this is at a higher concentration, 
and gets close to here, and the lines sort of merge. And then you get up to a quite high concentration, and at the quite high concentration, things sort of chug along, and you really never get close enough to this line to see what would happen. Uh, however, the diffusion is faster, and the um, There's a region where gamma over Q squared is like Q to the zero, and as you increase the concentration, that region gets broader. There's no reason to suppose it disappears. So that, those are very nice experiments, and that is about the best that has been done. Okay, so those are all of the interesting experiments except one. And the one experiment very clever. It's something that we discussed when we talked about static light scattering. When we discussed static light scattering, um, we noted you could do experiments in which you took a visible polymer chain and you put it in a matrix formed of invisible chains. How, why are they invisible? Their index of refraction matched to the solvent, so the concentration fluctuations do not change the index of refraction of the solution. Mm -hmm. And if the index of refraction doesn't change, if dn dc of the matrix polymer is zero, it causes no light scattering. And now we can look at the diffusion of a matrix chain at large Q through a polymeric background. Unfortunately, this experiment has not been done by very many people. And it has not been done in a great deal of detail. The person who did it, though, was Martin. And Martin's uh, probe polymer was 48 megadalton. That, by synthetic organic chemists' trade standards, is enormous polystyrene. The matrix was 110 kilodalton polyvinyl methyl ether, and it was at 40% by weight. Now, comment on 40% by weight is you have polymer chains. There are lots of them because 40% of the volume pretty much is these polymers. And the space between the polymer chains starts to get comparable in size to the diameter of a solvent molecule. After all these chains are while these chains are enormously long, their cross section the cross section of a polymer chain isn't very big. <clears throat> and therefore, if I tell you something is 40 percent by volume, the cross section in cross section, if I do a slice and look at the ends to come out, looks something like that. And these spaces are getting quite small. They're getting small enough that saying we have solvent hydrodynamics due to solvent flow. The solvent can't always flow. It doesn't fit. And so we are about as high as you can get in concentration mm -hmm. and blandly talk about solvent flow being the hydrodynamics. Well, what Martin did was to measure D versus Q square, and at low concentrations, D, which is gamma over Q square, is about independent of wave vector. And then out, out here it takes off, and we have a gamma proportion, relaxation rate proportional to QQ, which is what we've seen. And now Martin comes to his important point. There are two sorts of models of polymer dynamics that, that sort of fit this description. There are models like Kirkwood and uh, Zim model that say hydrodynamic interactions go as one over the distance. <coughs> 
And there are models like the Rouse model and the Rouse, oops, Rouse model says there are no hydrodynamic interactions. Rouse is used as an approximation and melts, where it sort of gives the right answer, uh, on the statement there's no solvent, there's no hydrodynamics. Now that's not quite as sensible as it sounds. Uh, however, the assert, however, there is an effect called hydrodynamic screening. The hydrodynamic screening idea is a statement about what happens to hydrodynamic interactions at large concentration and the assertion which has mi very mixed support in the literature is that hydrodynamics interactions go as e to some dying exponential over R. Why should we be concerned about screening? Well, the screening lengths are quite short. As a result, if I have this 48 megadolphin polymer that uh, was being studied by Martin, this exponential decay term here means that a part of the polymer here and a part of the polymer there have no interactions, no hydrodynamic interactions. And therefore, a Rouse-type dynamics ought to be reasonably accurate. However, Kirkwood looks at the internal modes and proposes gamma is like Q cubed. Rouse looks at the internal modes and proposes gamma is like Q to the 4. Well, that's very nice, but which do you find experimentally? That is, at least in this system, which had an enormously concentrated matrix polymer, fairly high molecular weight, at least in this system, Martin's interpretation is quite clearly we have Kirkwood Zim dynamics, we do not have Rouse dynamics, <coughs> and therefore there is no hydrodynamic screening. That's what comes out of Martin's <coughs> analysis. Martin stops with saying we have Kirkwood Riceman dynamics. Well, oh, he does say T proportional to 1 over R. Well, that's same as saying there's no screening. He does not say there's no screening. He just says the hydrodynamic interactions are described by the unseen, unscreened form. All right. We now push ahead. <clears throat> when I started off as a graduate student, the puzzle we are going to talk about was totally obscure and very controversial. Uh, gradually it became clear which answers were wrong and only very recently um, did it become clear what the correct answer is. The puzzle is the mystery of the slow mode. Okay, suppose we take a uh, polymer solution and we measure its scattering function and we plot versus log t. The things we've talked about so far have related to the initial decay rate and the decay of an early mode. And the internal modes act at very early times because they decay quickly. We're talking about things at the other end of the time scale regime. Namely, we're talking about things that happen at very long times. And what happens if you take a polymer solution and you measure its scattering spectrum and you go out to long times Sometimes you see an additional, very slow relaxational mode. A mode that is way too slow to be center of mass diffusion, and it's not at all clear what it is. At least it wasn't originally. Um, indeed, at first, it was highly controversial. Some research groups flatly denied that there was a um, 
um, slow mode, and they claimed it was bad experimental technique. Uh, other groups were quite certain that their technique was just fine, thank you, because they could produce lots of solutions that did not have slow modes, and other solutions which were about as easy to, or hard to work with, in which they consistently found a slow mode. So they were convinced there was a slow mode. Um, at the early times, you had digital correlators that could cover, oh, a range of 100 in relaxation time. And that just was not adequate to study the slow mode effectively. What you really needed was a modern multi-tau machine, which will study, say, from a microsecond up to 100 seconds simultaneously. And you get a range of a huge, a huge range in time scale for relaxations. With a huge range of time scale, you can actually consistently see slow modes if they're there. Well, consistently is one of these interesting questions. Uh, the slow mode, I emphasize, has nothing at all to do with the internal modes, which are a short time phenomenon. Okay, so we then get into an argument, what is the slow mode? And the first several rounds of experiments, which is where we'll finish up this lecture, really didn't so much say the slow mode is X. They said the slow mode is not X. And a list of things, possible interpretations that could be rejected for the slow mode were the first to be developed. A very important paper on this is due to Baloge and Tyrell. They looked at 10 polymer samples. The polymer samples were from several different sources. And if you looked at them, what you discovered was that, well, if you went up to large concentrate, if you looked at the samples, let's start at low concentration. <coughs> At small concentration, some of the samples were highly monodispersed and gave you a unimodal spectrum. And some of the samples can, were polydispersed, that is, they contained polymers with a range of different molecular weights. And these gave you a broad, but basically unimodal spectrum. Broad unimodal, yes, each molecular weight is giving, say, an exponential of its own diffusion rate. There are a range of molecular weights present, so there are a range of diffusion coefficients present. <clears throat> so the spectrum is not a pure exponential, but it clearly only has one mode to it. That's a small concentration. And these, what you saw here, the relaxation rate depends on Q square, which says you're looking at a diffusive process. <clears throat> then they went out to large C. And at large concentration, the um, materials that get were polydispersed and gave you a broad a uh, unimodal spectrum still gave you a broad unimodal spectrum. And the materials that were unimodal at small c gave you a bimodal distribution. That is, you could see in their spectrum a second relaxational mode with a very long lifetime. Both modes were Q square dependent meaning they appeared to correspond to diffusion. Well, one explanation is, uh, gee, something about the broad molecular weight distribution suppresses the slow mode. So let us take the unimode, the narrow molecular weight distribution polymers, and mix them. And now you have something that's polymodal, or uh, polydispersed, but its original parts all showed the slow mode. And if you do that, the spectrum is still bimodal. That is, there is some feature of the system that sometimes gives you a bimodal distribution, 
and sometimes scattering spectrum, and sometimes doesn't, but it's not the molecular weight distribution. And the pattern of when you do or do not see the, the uh, polymer slow mode is quite an, unambiguous here. So um, you can say there is a slow mode. It's very definitely not due to polydispersity. In a sense, that's unfortunate because there's a beautiful argument due to Lodge explaining how a po polydispersed system could give you a slow mode at high concentration. Namely, you take the mixture, you increase the concentration, and if, as you do, there is a differential effect of concentration on the smaller molecules and the larger molecules. And the smaller molecules have their motions retarded less, and the larger molecules have their motions retarded much, much more, and suddenly the solution, because it acts differently on small and large molecules, Tur would turn this from a broad unimodal into a bimodal distribution because the big molecules will move really, really slowly. Well, they do do, Lodge is right, the distribution here gets broader, but that is clearly not the correct explanation for the polymer slow mode. Okay. So what other explanations can you come up with? Uh, let us come up, let us consider the experiment due to Paul Verari. And what was done was to say, we will take a polymer solution. We will drop the polymer solution through a molecular filter, something that passes things the size of individual polymer chains and blocks larger objects. The reason you do this to make light scattering solutions is to get rid of dust and other things that scatter light that you aren't interested in. But what their idea was, let us see what happens when we filter, and we filter on a size that's modestly larger than a single polymer chain. And what they found was that if you filter, you can filter out the slow mode, meaning the slow mode corresponds to something that's decently large. Well, gee, that might cheer up all of the people who thought the slow mode was due to dust. And it would say that <coughs> the reason these people saw the slow mode was they weren't filtering well enough. <coughs> However, wait a few hours, <coughs> you get recovery. <coughs> that is, <coughs> we're going to for a second get a drink. That will all drop out of the video. <coughs> As I was saying, you filter things out, the slow mode vanishes. Well, that could say explain there was dust in the system to do that, except for one little detail. You have recovery. You wait a few hours and the slow mode comes back. Well, the dust particles are not sneaking back into the sample cell. So the only explanation is you are looking at something that is physically in the system. <coughs> One thing that is not in the system, you could propose that the slow mode <coughs> 
was some sort of an extra hydrodynamic mode. You would have an extra hydrodynamic mode if the system somehow managed to acquire a set, an extra variable that was almost but not quite conserved and therefore propagated almost diffusively or disappeared. Well, you can exclude the hydrodynamic mode interpretation <coughs> It's no more possible to filter out a hydrodynamic mode than it is to say take a liquid, pass it through a filter, and separate it into two liquids, one of which only shows the Rayleigh line of the scattering spectrum, and one of which only shows the brill one line. That's impossible, and therefore simple hydrodynamic mode interpretations are also ruled out. Last experiment, this was done in my laboratory by O'Connell. And uh, O'Connell and their string of authors. And what was to do done was to measure the intensity of scattering divided by the concentration as we add, con as we add polymer. You divide by C because, you know, there are more chains, there will be more scattering. And the intensity slowly falls, <coughs> and you cross the line at which the slow mode becomes visible. If the slow mode were due to dense clusters, balls of chains that never quite dissolved or something, the intensity would go up quite dramatically when you cross the boundary into the region where their slow mode is visible. No, nope, that's not what happens. The intensity just keeps going downhill. And this measurement fairly respectably rules out the possibility that um, the slow mode is due to some sort of particle chain aggregation. I have run us out of time, and therefore we are at an end.